Hello everyone, welcome as you join us for another one uh, of our sayings from the cross by Jesus uh, according to the Gospels. Uh, we believe that seven sayings were spoken uh, from the cross, uh, certainly according to the Gospels. And tonight it's the opportunity to look at the sixth of our seven sayings, not in a chronological way, uh, but the uh, saying in John's Gospel, John 19, uh, in which he records uh, three sayings that Jesus spoke from the cross. And this is the middle one of those three, according to John. John 19, verses 28 and 29. Feel free uh, to follow in your Bible, or if you have access to Scripture, and uh, we see these words. After this, when Jesus knew now that all was finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And may God bless his word to us uh, today. So it's the saying, I am thirsty or I thirst. And uh, again, it's a saying that's endemic to John's Gospel. You won't find it in any of the others. Uh, and it seems at first light a saying that is very obvious why Jesus would say it. He's hanging on a cross, remember, in the baking sunshine. He hasn't received any hydration of any kind. Uh, he's in agony and he's dying. So it's obvious his body is crying out uh, for some sort of liquid refreshment on the cross. But is that all that it is? Is that all that Jesus means in this saying, I thirst or I am thirsty? And particularly remember we're looking at John's Gospel. John is someone who writes succinctly. He's not a flowery writer. He doesn't put things in that don't really need to be there in in sense of you think of Mark's gospel. Mark is a very flowery writer. He talks about people sitting down on the green grass. Therefore, you probably think to yourself, well, grass is green. Why would Mark add the word green uh, to the text? But John is very different. He's very succinct in what he says. And it's also the most theological of the four gospels in the Bible. Therefore, there is a lot of deep meaning behind anything uh, that John has put in. Uh, to the gospel and everything is glorify God the Father. Jesus' very life glorifies God the Father. Even though Jesus is God, he still glorifies the Father through everything that he does. I want to ask you a little something before we go any further. I want you to think of your favourite drink this evening. Uh, you may have uh, something in mind that you do like from time to time. I absolutely hate fizzy drinks. Now, you might think, well, that's a bit strange. You don't like Fanta, therefore you don't like Coke. You don't like stuff like that. No, anything uh, with has been carbonated in any way, I do not like. Even if I was absolutely busting with thirst and had done a long run or something, I was sweating and needed hydration very quickly, I wouldn't thank you for a fizzy drink. I would not find it refreshing in any way, shape or form. I prefer something that is still more with water in it. But you uh, may think differently and you may have your own favourite drink that refreshes you uh, when you think of it. Tonight, of course, it is Jesus looking for something in liquid form to sustain him here on the cross. Now, the three sayings in John are all closely linked and most people believe that they were all said in a short space of time from the cross, according to John. And the reason why we know that is that uh, not only is, are the verses uh, very tight, within about five different verses in the text, we have all three sayings. But also there are link words uh, within the scripture itself. Remember the previous saying, woman, here is your son, here is your mother, Jesus said from the cross. And then verse 28, after this. Now, it doesn't give us an idea of the time, of course, but 
most people would recognize this as a, quite a short space of time after this. In other words, pretty well straight away, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. And then you see another link word in verse 30, and we'll look at this particular saying next week at the final saying from the cross, it is finished, when Jesus had received the wine. So these are all in quick succession, I think, these sayings from the cross, and they're very much up toward the last minutes even of Jesus' earthly life when he says them. So Jesus knew that all was now finished. What does that mean? Well, Jesus, of course, is God. Therefore, he's bound to know the timeline of the world in any way, shape or form, in all its intricacies. He knew that all was now finished. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. He's the judge. He holds time in his hand. He knows all things. But somehow the words, it is finished, come up. And we'll look at them next week, as I've already said. After that he knew all that was now finished. Surely Jesus has to physically die for all to be finished. Because it's simply not just his death ebbing, his life, sorry, ebbing away to death here. But also it is finished means much, much more than simply just I am dying. Jesus knew that all was now finished even more before he physically passes away. So is he talking about his life here or is it something else? This is the only gospel that reports this knowledge too on the cross. John is the only one who talks about Jesus knowing all that was now finished. You see, it's speaking either in the present or the past tense. It's not futuristic. Jesus actually hasn't expired yet. But yet he knows that all is now finished. So, we're going to look at two theological terms now. They're... Uh, partly to do with this but they do fit into a lot of how people understand scripture or how God uh, ticks himself and these two words are foreknowledge or predestination now they are different they sound like similar words but they are different if something is predestined then it is set from the very beginning that it can't be changed it is set in motion and it cannot be changed. Do we believe in a God who predestines everything from the beginning of time? If we do, we may have problems with why do we pray? Or we might have problems with, well, what happens to the person who sins all the time? If that's predestined from the beginning of time, then they have no choice but to sin. And it could go even further in realms of Calvinism, now, Calvinism was a very Puritan form of Protestantism, and there's still strains of it today uh, in our churches, in many places, and in our belief. Calvinists believed uh, God predestined everything from the beginning of time. He also believed in what was known as limited grace and limited atonement. And therefore, only a certain number of people would go to heaven. Therefore, only a certain number of people would be followers of Jesus, predestined. Where is free will in all of this? If we have a God who predestines, therefore free will does not exist. Everything is set in stone. I do not adhere to that subscription or theology. I believe much more in a God of foreknowledge. A God who knows everything, but in his love and his mercy has given us free will. And out of free will come choices that you and I make every day in life. There are consequences to all our choices, some good, some bad. I believe God knows the outcome of those choices, but he's willing to let the human being make them. Therefore, that is not predestination. It's a foreknowledge. In other words, he knows the outcome, but the sense of free will is given to the human being to make the choice in the first place. 
So the big question is, do you believe that God, from the beginning of time, predestined Jesus to die on the cross? Or is it because of the fall when Adam and Eve let sin into the world? Now God knew eventually human beings, they're never going to be get, the, get themselves into heaven. They can't. They're born in sin. They're tainted with sin in this world. Therefore, they need someone to get them out of it. They'll never be fit enough for heaven because God, remembering all his purity and holiness, cannot look upon sin. And us human beings carry it. We're tainted with it. We're in a world full of it. Therefore, how on earth can we come into God's presence if sin dwells in our lives? So did God say from then that eventually he's thinking, human beings can't save themselves. I need to send my son into the world. Or was it something to do with foreknowledge and knowing the choice that humanity would make and go the wrong road that then he would send his son into the world? Big questions. I'll leave them with you. I'll not give you the answers of, or how I see them, but they are there. But I very much believe in a God of foreknowledge. When Jesus knew that all was now finished, perhaps there are certain things possibly predestined in the world. Perhaps Jesus going to the cross was one of them from the beginning of time. But I like to think that God works in an unfolding universe, an unfolding humanity and what they do. Certain things, big things I think, yes, are set in stone. But there are many, many other things that he works with in the realm of foreknowledge. So perhaps we have a mixture of the two theologies. Who knows? They're both challenging thoughts. But nonetheless, verse 28 tells us Jesus knew that all was now finished. He knew. He knew the outcome of his death. Even though he hasn't said the words yet, it is finished. He knew the outcome. He knew that his choice that he made to die on the cross was following the Father's will. He's in complete control on the cross. Remember, he is still God. He has complete control of what is happening. So in Jesus' foreknowledge as God, he knew that all was now finished. So I am thirsty. Why does John put this saying in here? It seems a frivolous saying. At first light, it's simply obvious because, obviously, he is thirsty. What's the importance of this saying when a wittier one could suffice or could be left out altogether? Well, this is where we're getting at now. One of the things is, and it's there in verse 28, is that Jesus fulfilled scripture by saying, I am thirsty, I thirst. And follow me, if you will, to Psalm 69 and verse 21. And in here we see Jesus fulfilling the words from this psalm on the cross. They give me poison for food, and for my thirst they give me vinegar to drink. And this is where Jesus fulfills those words from the psalms. Now I want you to take you back to verse 19 and 20 as well, because they're part of what is going on at Calvary. You know the insults I receive. My shame and dishonour, my foes are all known to you. Insults have broken my heart, so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They give me poison for food, and for my thirst, they give me vinegar to drink. So you can see there from the psalm, and other parts of Psalm 69, that very much are fulfilled uh, during the time of crucifixion. You have the insulters there from Psalm 69, who are the people, of course, who mock Jesus uh, uh, on Good Friday. It obviously shows Jesus' humanity. I thirst. He fulfills scripture. But in a few moments, we're going to look at something much more theological about these words. So verse 29 tells us a jar full of sour wine was standing there. And you're thinking to yourself, that's a bit odd. Why on earth is there a jar of sour wine standing near the crucifixion site? Is this something that 
normally is there. So therefore, are, is there a jar at every cross or is it intermittently found, these jars, along the way? And then they, we're not told who they are, but they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to Jesus' mouth. Believe it or not, the jar full of sour wine is commonplace. It is normal to have that at the site of crucifixion. Sour wine is a vinegar type substance. Disgusting. Imagine drinking vinegar, uh, taking off the cap there before you have your, your chips and just simply drink, drinking vinegar. Dare I say your throat would be uh, a little raspy and your eyes may water taking too much of it. It's very acidic and it's not what you would call something you'd pour into your cup and have a drink in the common sense. But this is a vinegar type substance in this jar. And we have a branch of hyssop. Have you ever heard of that word before? Hyssop. And where does it come from? Well, we'll look at that in a moment too. Probably the hyssop was a pole-like uh, shape. Hyssop branch, uh, the plant it grows from, there is certain parts of it that have a, an extended pole-type uh, uh, shape to it. Hyssop itself uh, has a blue flower and it has aromatic leaves. It was used in purification rituals in Judaism for centuries. And the reason why it can reach Jesus' mouth, we're not told how high the cross is. Crosses did differ in height uh, when the Romans crucified. We're not sure of the height of Jesus, but obviously there's some height that they can reach up to his mouth with a sponge attached to this uh, branch of hyssop. A sponge was a common thing kept in the kit of a Roman soldier, particularly in the death squads, those who um, put the crucifixions together. They would have carried a sponge, knowing full well it would have been needed at some stage to try and satisfy the thirst of the, the criminals or those who were dying on the cross. So this was attached to the branch of hyssop and held to Jesus' mouth. The they in the verse is obviously the Roman soldiers. No one can remember can tamper uh, with those uh, being condemned on the cross. Only the soldiers. They have complete control of this. So it has to be the soldiers. Hyssop of its purification ritual. It's interesting that it's used because Jesus is purifying the world through his death on the cross by promising the forgiveness of sins. So it's interesting the use of hyssop. The Roman soldiers might know this. But it was a common plant in the area and they used it to help Jesus drink. Psalm 51 is a very famous psalm too. It's that psalm when King David lay with Bathsheba when he shouldn't have. Remember he killed Uriah, her husband, or got him killed rather, uh, in the front line of battle. And then he slept with Bathsheba. He had plenty of other wives. And then you remember the outcome of that was, here's a wee bit of God's foreknowledge again. Uh, he made a bad choice, wrong consequence, came out, the baby died. Bathsheba got pregnant and the baby died. And you remember Nathan the prophet spoke that story about the little lamb, the parable in the Old Testament against King David. And one of David's great cries of repentance and remorse is Psalm 51, based on what he did with Uriah and Bathsheba. And in there, it says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. So David knew the use of hyssop. It's used for centuries uh, for purification rituals within Judaism. You'll find it popping up from time to time again, particularly in the Old Testament. This wine, this sour wine, this vinegar type stuff would also act as a painkiller to a degree, but a very small degree. It was something that Jesus needed at the time. And again, in a few moments, we're going to look at uh, why he actually took it. Because you may remember earlier in the story, when Jesus was on the Via Dolorosa, on his way to the crucifixion site, he was offered wine mixed with myrrh. Do you remember that? Or gall, as it's been called in some translations. Slightly different liquid to this stuff here. Wine mixed with myrrh he was offered, but he wouldn't take it. 
Wine mixed with myrrh. Myrrh was something that would have put you into a comatose state. In other words, you would have been very sedated as you were crucified to try and alleviate the pain. But Jesus chose not to take that first drink because he wanted the fullness of the agony. That's the lengths he went to for you and me upon the cross. He wouldn't take the wine so he could feel, feel the full pain of his death. But this time he does. But again, there's a deeper reason for why he took it. It's not just simply because he's thirsty. Something more to it. But remember, it's disgusting. It's a painkiller to a degree, but a lot less than the myrrh-inflected wine. There's a bit of frankincense, we believe, in this wine. Remember myrrh and frankincense? Given by the wise men along with gold, and they had great significant meaning for Jesus' life. And this is where they come into effect now in many ways. Frankincense is in this wine because it gives that kind of uh, painkiller type uh, strength to it. So it's not just vinegar on its own. Oxos is the word in here in the original scripture for wine vinegar. Oxos. And it's a, it's a, a wine with no alcohol in it. So in other words, it's been open to oxygen. It has uh, somehow broken down uh, chemically. And uh, now the alcohol has somehow disappeared out of it. And it's simply a vinegar of some kind. How it was made, we believe, is acetic acid, which is present in ordinary day vinegar. There's a bacteria from acetic acid, which was mixed with alcohol. But what it does in turn is simply produce pure acetic acid itself. When it's exposed to oxygen, then you have this sour wine in this jar at the cross. It actually had a name and its name was Posca. That's what the Roman soldiers called it. And it was something that they swigged themselves. They drank from this stuff. It was something that they used as a, almost like a party-like affair around the, the dying people that were on the cross. See, the Romans were ruthless. Someone dying on a cross was good fun to them in many ways. They were quite sadistic with all of this going on. And uh, they didn't hold back in the full fury of the death. So they've been sitting around drinking this stuff. And uh, remember, there's no alcohol in it, therefore it won't affect their judgment in any way. They can still keep guard and be on duty. But it's called Posca. And what the Romans did was they diluted it with water even more and they started to swig it uh, around the, the execution sites. It was cheap stuff as well. And also it was believed that it killed harmful bacteria. So if you took a drink of this stuff, it would have killed other things that you maybe you'd ingested and kept you healthy in many ways too. So there's all these aspects to this particular stuff. And then the hyssop also has uh, something very deep and theological behind it too. We looked at it there a moment ago, but hyssop was also used at the Passover, at the Jewish meal, the Jewish cedar meal at Passover. Hyssop was used there because of its purification symbolism. And it was closely aligned to the Passover lamb. Remember, a lamb was slaughtered for the Passover meal and the people would eat of that and hyssop would have been present there, probably to flavour the lamb in some way. And who's the Passover lamb here on the cross? It's Jesus. It's another title for him. He's dying at Passover. He is the ultimate sacrifice. Remember the first Passover in Exodus when the Israelites were leaving Egypt and the angel of death passed by the, the doorways that had the Passover lamb blood upon it, knowing that those people inside trusted in the true Lord. That was when the first Passover happened. And Jewish people still today celebrate that. But Jesus, for Christians, is the final Passover lamb, the ultimate sacrifice. Therefore, another analogy of the hyssop, which was used alongside the Passover lamb. Josephus was an early Jewish historian, and he lived not long after Jesus' time. And he gleaned a lot of stuff in his writings. If, if people might say to us, we don't believe in the Bible, a lot of it's made up, uh, there's stories simply, and that is it. 
Well, if you don't believe in the Bible and you want to look at some historical documents that Jesus existed, that he died, and that he died by crucifixion, you can read Josephus, who was a third party, unbiased account of areas of Jesus' life. He wasn't a Christian. He was simply a Jewish historian who recorded Jesus' existence and his death. And he also records in his writings a wee town called Beth Zob, which is very near Jerusalem, and that simply means the house of Hyssop. Beth Zob means the house of Hyssop. Hyssop grew very naturally and very commonplace, a bit like probably our gorse bush, which you see there at uh, different seasons along the hedgerows. As common as that. Now, one of the big things behind I thirst is this. Jesus wanted to take the sour wine to wet his mouth because he had another saying yet to say. And a very important one and probably the most important one, which we'll look at next week from the cross. And he wanted to say it out with a great strength that people would hear this. The words, it is finished. And most theologians believe that the reason why Jesus took the wine was to clear his throat. You can remember how tired and weak he is at this time. And probably was his voice was down to a mumble, a whisper maybe even. But people heard at the right time the words that were being said. It is finished. The wine clears his throat. Because verse 30 is a hinging verse. When Jesus had received the wine, he says, it is finished. One of the reasons why uh, we see that um, the wine is consumed a certain amount when it's held to his mouth there in verse 29. There's another heresy out there uh, around the cross too, and I'll touch on it briefly here. It's called docetism, where some people believe that Jesus uh, didn't actually die on the cross. Somehow he fell into a comatose state or some sort of state of uh, being uh, dead-like, but not actually uh, passed away. And therefore he simply rose again when he came out of that comatose state. It's called docetism. It's also the belief that Jesus being fully God, crucifixion would be nothing to him. He's simply going through the motions. Remember, Jesus is fully man as well. He's feeling the full force of this in his humanity. His humanity and his divinity are both there on the cross. It's docetic to think otherwise. That he's simply just God and the human side somehow disappears. And he doesn't feel half of this. And he doesn't die on the cross. He simply falls into like a, a coma-like state. And that unfortunately then has fed uh, Gnosticism, which was something in the early church after Jesus' time and the early disciples. that People believed you could strive to please God, that there's something of a divine spirit in everybody, and that they simply climb a ladder to please God by being very good, uh, by giving, by being charitable, by going to church, by being law-abiding, and you name it, keep going. There are ways to try and please God. That, again, is heretical. The Bible tells us it is by grace you are saved. Only by grace. Not by trying to please God, because you never will. But the Gnostics believed that. And they believed in the very divine sense of God on the cross. And that they had to follow Jesus and try to please him to become divine themselves. And you can actually see aspects of Gnosticism still in our churches today and in Christians, in inverted commas, who believe that the better things you do, the closer you'll be to God and you'll be saved by that. But that's in your own strength, not by the grace of Christ or his Holy Spirit. And it feeds right back to Gnosticism and from docetic thoughts from the cross that Jesus is God fully there on the cross. He wasn't human at that time. And he didn't feel all of this. And that we need to be more divine to try and please him. Finally, folks, the words, I am thirsty. And here is a great challenge for all of us. Remember, Jesus is an evangelist to the very last breath. All of his sayings have great meaning. 
not just the physicality of what is going on or the practical circumstances around Jesus at the time. They have deep theological meaning, and particularly here in John's Gospel. So this I am thirsty is simply not a human cry and need to have liquid. It's not simply just to fulfill Scripture, but that's what Jesus does there too. I want to take you to the original word for thirst in John's Gospel. You may know the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And you hear about living water in there and the thirst for living water. The word there is the same word that is used here on the cross. And I am thirsty. The original scriptures teach us that the word thirst is the same throughout John's gospel. And what that means is the crying out for the will of the Lord, that his will be done, that his kingdom will grow that it will extend. I thirst for the Lord's kingdom to come. That's what Jesus is saying here alongside his natural thirst and the fulfilling of scripture. I also thirst for living water to be going out from me now as I die into the world to save and to build the church and the kingdom of God here on earth. He's an evangelist to the very end. So I hope you see the weight of those words. It's not simply just a human thirst or not just simply to fulfill scripture. But this sense of reaching out, pouring out the living water into the world, thirsting for his kingdom to grow as soon as he dies because he has to die to start that and offer the forgiveness of sins and salvation by his death. Six times in John's Gospel, that word thirst is used. And it all has the same word in original scripture, meaning living water. That sense of pouring out the building of God's kingdom through his spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for these words from the cross, I thirst or I am thirsty. Lord, we, we see humanly how dry you were, that you needed uh, that awful sour wine to clear your throat too, so you could echo the amazing words, it is finished, which we'll look at next week. But also, Lord, you fulfilled scripture from Psalm 69. And also, Lord, looking at the original word for thirst in John's gospel, that sense of living water that you pour out on all who receive you, that you want to see your kingdom grow, your kingdom built, and your Holy Spirit continues to do that today because you thirst, you want the kingdom of God to grow. And Lord, we thank you and we pray that by your Holy Spirit that we continue to walk with you and we thirst for more of you in our lives ourselves every day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. May God bless you and we'll see you soon. Amen.